Hello everyone, welcome to today's live broadcast, The Genetics of Aquaculture Genotyping with GBS and Arrays for Species Identification and Trade Improvement. I'm Robert Castellanos of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Thermo Fisher. Thermo Fisher Scientific Inc. is a world leader in serving science with revenues of 17 billion and approximately 50,000 employees in 50 countries. Our mission is to enable our customers to make the world healthier, cleaner, and safer. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window and submit your problems through the green Q&A button. I would like to introduce today's speakers, Dr. Beacom and Dr. Balti. Today's first speaker is Dr. Beacham. Dr. Beacham has been a research scientist in fisheries in Oceans Canada for the past 37 years, largely at the Pacific Biological Station in Nanaimo, British Columbia. He is the head of stock identification research within the Molecular Genetic Laboratory and has gen examined genetic variations to evaluate population structure and associated stock identification applications across a range of Pacific salmon species. He has employed almazines, mini satellites, microsatellites, and single nucleotide polymorphisms (SNPs) in salmon stock identification applications. His current focus is to evaluate and apply parentage-based tagging and genetic stock identification techniques for Chinook and Coho salmon in British Columbia, particularly for hatchery populations. <clears throat> this work is conducted by developing panels for primers that amplify specific fragments of DNA amplicons and single PCR reactions, and then direct DNA sequencing of the amplicon is employed in order to genotype individuals at selected SNPs in the amplicon. I'll now turn it over to the doctor for his presentation. Hello. Well, today I'm going to talk about uh, parentage-based tagging and genetic stock identification for Chinook and Coho salmon. It's some work that we've been doing here in British Columbia for the past few years. Now, the, the main uh, focus uh, of, of today's talk is parentage-based tagging. So that the underlying the principle of parentage-based tagging is that if you sample and genotype the broodstock at a hatchery, then this will provide uh, genetic tags for the offspring of the, of the parents. And we can re recover these tags through statistical parentage an analysis. Now, since this tagging process really only requires genotyping the parents, and these parents can produce thousands of offspring that are released from, from the hatchery, that parentage-based tagging is very highly efficient at marking. Now, when the juveniles are released from a hatchery, they can be adipose fin-clipped for Chinook salmon if they have a coat of wire tag. And for, for coho uh, in southern British Columbia, all of the hatchery production is adipose fin clip. So if you sampled these uh, clip fish upon uh, when, when they return to, to their uh, spawning locations, if you sample the clip fish, you should then be able to use a parentage-based tagging to identify these individuals back to their parents. And so that should provide the hatchery and a year of release. So th this is uh, uh, the same information that we get from our current uh, Code of Wire TAG program. So, so basically what we, we're, we're doing is we're genotyping the uh, parents in a, at a hatchery. 
the offspring are released, uh, then they rear in, in the ocean for an, a number of years. If they're coho, they can rear in the ocean for one or, or two years, Chinook maybe up to five or six years. When, when they come back a, as mature adults, then uh, if we sample the clipped fish in fisheries, we could then use statistical parentage analysis to I identify the, the individuals back to their parents and thus to their hatchery and, and their year of release. So, you know, we have this uh, code wire tag program where uh, physical tags are inserted into the nasal cartilage of, of individuals when they're released from a, a hatchery and they're subsequently sampled when, when they would return. So what we're looking at is can we use a genetics-based system to provide similar kinds of information where we have uh, fish that are, are sampled in highly mixed up ocean fisheries and can we use the genetic information to identify f individual fish to specific hatcheries in year of release when it can be a very large number of geographically diverse populations contributing to a mixed stock sample from a fishery. Now, we're, we're doing this uh, through a process called amplicon sequencing, and, and that is where uh, uh, primers are uh, applied in, in a panel and are used to target and amplify specific uh, uh, fragments of DNA known to contain SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms. And what amplicon sequencing does, it provides us with a, a cost-effective way to screen for hundreds of SNPs. Now, our current panel for COHO, uh, we currently have of 304 amplicons that are produced in our panel in a single PCR, and we're tracking 357 SNPs in those 304 amplicons. For Chinook salmon, our current panel uh, produces 319 amplicons, and we're currently tracking 419 SNPs. And we, we do all of our sequencing on an ion uh, torrent proton. Okay, so the uh, ob objective of uh, our work and uh, the focus of my talk today is was to evaluate the, the effectiveness of the direct amplicon sequencing for a stock identification of Chinook and coho salmon. Now, when we uh, have fish sampled at our hatchery, we can get uh, samples of fin clips that, that are put on blotter paper. Uh, they, they then come into our lab. Uh, we can extract DNA from, from those fish either using uh, our robotics or biosprint, or we've also been recently using a Kelex-based extraction method. And once the uh, DNA is extracted, we normalize it using our, our, our TCAN robotics to um, a concentration of uh, 40 nanograms per uh, milliliter. Okay, so once we have our extracted DNA uh, and, and we have it normalized, we then use our uh, primer pools. We have separate ones for both Chinook and for, for Coho. And this is where we do our amplification PCR, where for, for, for Coho, once we uh, use our, our panel, we're then expecting to get up to 304 amplicons for each individual. So after the uh, amplicons uh, have been uh, present, we we then take our uh, we we then go into the second stage uh, our second uh, PCR where we digest the ends of the amplicons and the reason uh, and again we we do that using robotics 
And the reason we, we do that is so that we can ligate our barcodes are to the amplicons. Now these barcodes are, identify the individual fish. Uh, we're currently using uh, 384 barcodes. Uh, we expect to go to 768 quite soon. We will probably be obtaining uh, the additional 384 barcodes on a, um, on a trial basis uh, sometime this year. Okay, so then once we have our, our amplicons uh, that have been with the individual barcodes ligated to them, we, we then clean up uh, the, the reaction again uh, and we, we then uh, combine our individual libraries, currently 384, we're going to 768 in the near future. We would then uh, put them on uh, the Ion Chef. Uh, we, the, the Ion Chef would then load the, uh, the, the chips that we would then put into our Ion Tort Proton for actually sequencing. Okay, so for uh, stock identification, there's, there's two main methods that we can use. And the first method is uh, parentage-based tagging, where the individuals are to be identified are genotyped, and then, if possible, we match them to their prospective parents through statistical parentage analysis. The, the, the software that we actually use is called Snippet. So we, we don't need any uh, genetic differentiation among individual populations contributing to a fishery when we use this analysis. All we need is some differences among parents. Now the second method that we use is genetic stock identification where the genetic profiles of whole populations that are, are potentially contributing to a mixed duck sample, we use those to estimate the stock composition of the sample and in some instances we estimate the origins of the individual fish in those uh, mixtures. So for our, our uh, basic data for coho salmon, we're, we're looking at uh, 117 populations. Uh, to, to date we've surveyed over 20,000 individuals across those 117 populations. Our uh, mean no call rate over the 302 SNPs that we use for population structure stock ID work is 2.7 percent with a, with a range of from 1.4 to 14. I should point out that we have 304 amplicons. Uh, one of them we use to identify the sex of the uh, individual. And the second one we use is to uh, identify the species. Uh, Chinook and, and coho would be the most likely to be misidentified, so we have a species ID SNP on the uh, panel. So we, we don't use those two SNPs when we do our parentage analysis or our, our stock ID work. So for the 302 SNPs that we use, we have a mean coverage rate of 263 times. And so we're, we have lots of room on our chip to add additional individuals to the chip and to have additional primers in our pool. And that would still allow us to have a reasonable coverage rate of about 30 times. Now for our our coho uh, um, panel, we have a coho origin primers uh, that we originally that were originally uh, identified in in coho. We have 250 of those. We have the the rest uh, a little over 50 from Chinook origin primers. Now some of our amplicons have more than uh, one SNP uh, per amplicon that we track. A, so we, we're tracking 304 amplicons, and in those amplicons, we're, we're tracking 376 SNPs. 
for parent edge analysis, we only use one uh, SNP per amplicon, um, and, but for genetic stock identification, it is possible to use uh, haplotype frequencies. So the additional SNPs that we are tracking will see application in our haplotype uh, frequency work. Now we have uh, surveyed uh, uh, 117 populations. They're from a range of locations. Here, so we, we have some uh, here in uh, in southeast Alaska. We we have a, a number of um, populations in uh, Queen Charlotte Islands or Haida Gwaii. We also have them in. Uh, in northern British Columbia, where the Nast and Skeena rivers are, in the central coast, on uh, the east and the west coast of Vancouver Island. And then we have them in the uh, lower Fraser River, and here in the uh, Thompson River, which is a tributary of the Fraser. And then we have them down here in uh, uh, Puget Sound in Washington. Now, it's important when we're doing genetic stock identification that there be a regional population structure. And uh, that's uh, precisely what we have. As an example here, th this is a dendrogram that's uh, based on the, the, uh, the, f the frequencies, the allele frequencies at the 302 SNPs that, that, that we have. And you can see here we have uh, uh, a, a Thompson River com component that's uh, quite and that's quite uh, distinct. And here we have a uh, Lower Fraser River component. We have a n number of populations in that group. Here's all of our our uh, Puget Sound populations that we've looked at. And here we have our east coast of Vancouver Island. And over here we have our um, uh, what we call the Georgia Strait mainland. These are populations on mainland BC that are north of Vancouver. And then here we have some populations from the west coast of Vancouver Island. So con continuing on, yeah, these are our uh, populations from the uh, Queen Charlotte Islands, or what's, what's now known as Haida Gwaii, all, all through here. And you can see that we have a, a number of populations on the central coast of British Columbia. So the, the, the take home message here is that there's a strong uh, regional population structure in, in Coho. So how does that uh, um, relate to, to stock ID? Well, what we, we wanted to test the, the accuracy of our, of our, uh, of our when we determine the, the origins of fish. So in, in this uh, year, we, when the uh, juveniles were fin clipped from various hatcheries, we, we asked that, some, uh, that the fin, fin clips be, be saved. Uh, we we had hoped to get a, a, a hundred per hatchery, so be, because we knew what hatchery they came from and when they were clipped, these were our known origin samples, and, and that's what we have here, all of our uh, juveniles. So we were able to then, uh, because we had already genotype to broodstock, we would then be able to use our parentage analysis to I identify them back to their parents. And here we had a, a sample of coated wire tagged individuals, so we knew because they were coated wire tagged what hatchery they came from. 
So when we made the assignments uh, via uh, snippet, via parentage analysis, we were able to assign 926 of those individuals, and we assigned them with 100% accuracy, uh, both respect to population and age, when we had a uh, potential donor populations of, of 117 populations over multiple brood years. When we couldn't make the assignment via snippet, we then passed those individuals to be assigned via GSI. And you can see that we did a, a pretty good job of as assigning those individuals to their respective uh, populations. Overall, we had uh, 99 uh, right here that we assigned via GSI, and our, our overall assignment accuracy was about 84%. So we have uh, one hatchery, Inch Creek, in the lower part of the Fraser, where we have sampled broodstock in 2006, 9, 12, 14, and 15. So that allowed us to do some uh, assignments of uh, individuals in the broodstock. And you can see that in our, our first year of, of uh, assignments, that was the, the, the 2009 broodstock, we assigned uh, 154 of, of those in individuals to the correct uh, uh, population, being Inch Creek, and to the correct uh, brood year, which was 2006. Uh, coho salmon typically have a three-year life cycle in British Columbia. Uh, most of the individuals mature at age three, although uh, there are a portion of males that mature at age two, and, and these are, are known as jacks. And you can see that overall, uh, okay, I should point out in 2014, uh, we only could identify seven individuals in, in the broodstock uh, via parentage analysis. Uh, this was because we, we didn't have samples from the 2011 uh, broodstock, which would have uh, been the, the the parents, although we did identify, uh, we did assign seven individuals to the 2012 broodstock, and these were the jacks that, that were incorporated into the, the 2014 broodstock. But overall, any assignments that we made via snippet were correct to both population and to the age of the individual. There were some assignments uh, via GSI to uh, some populations in the lower part of the Fraser. We're not sure if these were uh, assignment errors or actual strays. They could be actual strays as uh, origin, uh, fish of state river origin are also uh, transported to rearing at the Inch Creek hatchery and, and then they're, they're, they're taken back to Inch Creek to the Stave River for release, so it, it is possible we've had some uh, strays uh, coming into the Inch Creek broodstock. So it is possible to use uh, genetic stock identification to assign individuals to uh, specific regions. Uh, we have our Code of Wire Tag program that had 23 uh, predefined regions where individuals can be assigned to. So we had uh, two probability levels in terms of checking the accuracy of, of our assignments of individual fish to these regions. The first probability level was at the 50% level. So if we if our assignment probability was less than 50%, we uh, discarded these fish from the analysis. And you can see that of the, of the approximately 19,000 fish that we assigned, uh, we, our overall assignment accuracy to one of these 23 regions was about uh, 96%. 
when we went to a higher level of uh, confidence at the we had to have assignment at 85 percent level we had an overall accuracy of 98.4 uh, percent as assignment to region so our next steps well we're going to be sampling jacks that are returning in 2016 uh, to the canadian hatcheries we're going to be analyzing the, the broodstock from, from those hatcheries. <clears throat> We're going to be adding additional populations from, from the uh, Thompson, Coastal Washington, and Columbia, and Oregon for our GSI side of our application. And we're also increasing the number of amplicons that we're going to be deriving from the panel from 304. We're just having the panel redesigned. We're adding another 260. Uh, uh, primer pairs to, to the pool, so we hope to have approximately between five and 600 amplicons that would be derived from single PCR. Uh, switching briefly to Chinook, we have this same type of uh, result in Chinook salmon. We have a regional population structure, which is, again, what, what you want to see uh, when, when you're coming to do genetic stock identification. Oh, as an example here, we have uh, all of our, here we have all of our populations that we've sampled on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Okay, so we, we've done the same type of an analysis uh, for Chinook as, we, as I previously outlined for Coho. We had uh, fin clips sampled from uh, juveniles uh, for, the, for 2016. So these would have been parents from, these would have been offspring from the 2015 parents. We've uh, analyzed them in our lab. We're, we're still in the, uh, the process. We haven't quite finished all, all of the, of the broodstock an analysis of uh, all of the, the 2015 broodstock. And, and, and that's, that's the reason why uh, we were only to identify only five individuals to uh, parents at, at, at uh, the Quinsum Hatchery on the east coast of Vancouver Island. We still haven't uh, uh, analyzed all of the broodstock for that particular uh, hatchery. But for, for the others, when we've made the assignments, uh, we've, uh, again, with respect to, just like Chinook and Coho, when we made the assignments, we had, they were assigned with 100% accuracy to uh, population and age. You can see down here at the, uh, at the Shahidas Hatchery in southern BC, uh, we had uh, two stocks uh, released from that hatchery. Um, we I, I identified them accurately, and uh, we were quite, quite pleased to see those, those results. So again, uh, this this comes to the uh, the uh, genetic stock identification component of of the application. Uh, where we have hatcheries uh, where cotowire tags are applied, <coughs> uh, these fish are adipose fin clipped upon release. And if we look at how well we can identify uh, these fish to specific hatcheries, so that this is uh, looking at our brood stock, you, you can see here that uh, by and large we can do a, a pretty good job. Uh, these are some uh, hatcheries here on the mainland of British Columbia. Uh, Chilliwack is in the lower Fraser. Chehalis is in the lower Fraser. Uh, Nicola is in the uh, um, Thompson River drainage. And you can see down here we have uh, these are populations on the east coast of Vancouver Island. And then Robertson here is on the west coast of Vancouver Island. So overall, we can do a, quite a good job of uh, identifying individual fish to specific hatcheries. So the, the overall question, does PBT actually work if there are lots of population choices? You know, there are some skeptics as to 
or, or critics uh, that uh, a genetic method could work in, in terms of identifying fish to individual populations when you had a large number of, of populations uh, that were, they could be potentially assigned to. So the answer seems to be yes, that assignments made by snippet appear to be accurate. And so that accurate assignment indicates the uh, hatchery release and year of release, so it gives you the age of the individual. And so that uh, parentage-based tagging can provide the equivalent information to that from Cotowire tags, so we get the individuals uh, plus the identification to families. So, so basically, uh, we, we think that we can have a genetic method of uh, stock identification, uh, this particularly parentage-based tagging, as a uh, possible assessment tool. And because the, the results for the assignment of known origin samples have, have worked out well, we're planning a large-scale trial to uh, Southern British Columbia coho salmon in, in 2017 and, and 2018. And then, you know, if we can apply it successfully, uh, we're providing an option between a Colorado tag program and a parentage-based tagging program for managers in fisheries and oceans. Well, the qu bottom line is, will uh, parentage-based tagging be applied in Canadian hatcheries? Uh, we're, we're, we're not sure. Uh, we would uh, will provide our our managers and staff with the option to to choose, and I'll wrap it up there with some uh, acknowledgement of our, our funding agencies. Uh, our coho work is funded through a, uh, a a Genome Canada project that we're involved in with a number of of uh, uh, Canadian universities. And I think I'll leave it at that and I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you so very much, Doctor, for your amazing presentation. Uh, we do have some questions and we do have some time to allow to answer those. The first question today is for you, Doctor, is what is the time taken to analyze a group of 384 samples in the lab? Well, in, in our lab, uh, in, we have um, uh, uh, one person who, who does the extractions. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of what we can do in a week. Uh, we have uh, one person who would who, who works for three days, who would extract uh, uh, 16 plates of 96 fish. So that would be uh, 1,536 fish per, per week. We have one person who works uh, sh uh, five days, uh, five short days, and she runs all of the uh, plates through a uh, through the Ion Chef, she, well, she 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 does the library build. Uh, she runs the plates through the Ion Chef and the Ion Torrent. Uh, so she runs. So so we do uh, two sh uh, chef runs per week, and each chef run has uh, two chips. Each chip has 384 fish. Uh, so uh, we have essentially four days four seven and a half hour working days for that person and we have one person who uh, does the essentially the, the bioinformatics for that uh, run so basically then and then that, that would be one day so we have eight working days to run uh, approximately 1536 fish so I guess the uh, long-winded answer is would take us about uh, two full working two person working days to uh, to analyze 384 fish but it would be done over a period of uh, 3 days thank you and so our next question is going to be what is the genome coverage of the snp markers 
were they pre-selected based on suspected or known importance in the adaption of salmons? Well, the, the genome coverage of our markers, uh, we've looked at that uh, through our Genome Canada project. Uh, Dr. Ben Coop at the University of Victoria is uh, sequencing the, the cold salmon genome and uh, we've, we, we've taken advantage of that by uh, providing our, uh, our Amplicon sequence information to, to Dr. Coop and he has mapped them to the coho genome and we have found that the uh, Amplicons are well distributed over all 30 uh, chromosomes that are present in the, in the coho genome. Uh, we've also done that for Chinook salmon, and again, we have found that those uh, uh, SNPs, those amplicons, are well distributed across the genome. Uh, coming back, did, did, did we select them? Uh, no. Uh, when we put our panels together, I simply uh, tried to uh, use all of the known uh, SNPs for both species that, that were available and uh, provided the sequence information to uh, Thermo Fisher and, and they designed the, uh, the uh, primers for us and we've just used them uh, as best we could. Now, uh, not all the SNPs were uh, was was it possible to uh, obtain uh, primers for? And there are some SNPs that we've obtained primers for that we've subsequently discarded because of uh, heterozygosity or Hardy Weinberg issues. And so what what we've left with are now are ones that are uh, heterozygosity is, is less than fifty percent, and they uh, t tend to be in Hardy Weinberg. All right, thank you very much. And what is the repeatability of the genotype scores? And this will be our last question for today. Uh, recently, and we found that when we uh, ran about, uh, I think it was around 120,000 genotypes. We compared genotypes uh, for all, all the, th the 302 SNPs. We had a, about, a, a, about 120,000 genotypes. Our uh, genotyping error rate was, uh, I think, 1.07% uh, across, across those. So it's it's about uh, what one would expect using uh, this this type of platform for genotyping. All right, thank you. And Doctor, do you have any final comments before we let you go? Well, I'm, I'm happy to have had the opportunity to provide uh, some uh, update on how we're, we're doing in our lab on our Chinook and Co. App applications. And if uh, there are any additional questions, I'll, I'll be pleased to answer them. I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Palti now. Dr. Palti has been with the USDA Agriculture Research Service since 2001. He currently holds the position of a research geneticist and lead scientist of the Genetics, Physiology, and Genomics Unit at the National Center for Cool and Cold Water Aquaculture, where he leads efforts to develop tools and resources for genomic research in rainbow trout 
and other salmons. The major genomic tools and resources that were developed for rainbow trout research by teams under Dr. Palti's leadership include a BAC physical map of the genome, an integrated physical and genomic map, a database of 145K RAD SNPs, a draft assembly of the rainbow trout genome sequence, RAD SNPs genetic maps for QTL mapping, a 57K SNP array. The major focus of Dr. Palti's current research is aimed at developing and evaluating strategies for genome-enabled selection and traits that cannot be measured directly on potential breeders in rainbow trout aquaculture. Dr. Palti collaborates with other geneticists, research physiologists, immunologists, microbiologists to map quantitative trait loci that affect disease resistance and aquaculture production efficiency with the overarching goal of identifying genes and genetic elements that can be utilized for improving aquaculture production efficiency and sustainability. I will now turn it over to Dr. Palti for his presentation. Okay, hey, uh, thank you, Bobby, for this uh, presentation, uh, this uh, introduction, sorry, and uh, I will get going. I have about 20 minutes, so uh, the slides that are at the beginning that are taken from a paper that we've already published, I may go through them a little bit too fast to some, but uh, please feel free to contact me you can find my email and contact information online if you need to. Just search my name and USDA ARS. Contact me, and I'll be glad to uh, share slides and more information or follow-up questions that individual scientists or people in the audience may have. So I'm talking about the 57K rainbow trout SNP chip that uh, we have developed in collaboration with uh, Aquagen and Sygen from Norway, and why did we go with SNP chip at the time we were doing uh, RADS, but uh, I'm comparing here uh, with uh, other uh, genotyping by sequencing in general. So uh, typically there are more SNPs that uh, you can uh, put on a chip and analyze uh, simultaneously. Uh, it's so it's uh, more throughput, faster and easier, and most uh, or very, very important uh, standardized so you can uh, repeat across populations, across studies between different labs, and basically you're talking about uh, the same SNPs, well defined SNPs, and uh, they're also, the results are very similar in quality, at least we have seen uh, between experiments and different uh, genotyping service provider, providers. It is at the time when we started, it was definitely more expensive than uh, RADS under our hands. We have to do it both uh, externally, so we do not have a sequencer, Illumina sequencer here for uh, genotyping by sequencing. We also do not have the equipment that is needed to actually scan and, and do the genotyping with the Axiom. So we send everything externally. Uh, but the cost uh, keeps coming down, and uh, recently with a new version that, that of the chip that, I'm, that I'll mention uh, shortly, it's really comparable, at least uh, under our hands. And then uh, it is very useful for applications uh, like population traceability, at least initial, to identify SNPs that differentiate an example that I will give from my own research for uh, genome-wide association studies and genomic selection and generating a, a dense genetic linkage map that can be used, that we have been using, been using here with, again, with our Norwegian collaborators uh, to improve the rainbow trout genome. So this is really, I'll go through this really briefly because this is just talking about how and um, for, I've seen some familiar names uh, among the attendees, so uh, so like a lot of you probably know, rainbow trout has a recent tetraploidization event or whole genome duplication, so uh, there are still significant portions of the rainbow trout chromosomes that still uh, are in a duplicated stage, so there can be four alleles for each marker. And then what we were, our approach was, at least initially with the 
was using rods and double haploid lines, homozygous lines, nearly clonal lines, uh, that we used to try to uh, filter out the, uh, the tetra tetrasomic uh, PSVs and MSVs are called. I will not get into those definitions right now, but at the end we, we had about a database of about 100, almost 150 thousand SNPs that uh, we, we had from rods of double haploids. And all of this is published. You can see at the bottom there uh, in 2014, the development of the RADS database. Then uh, this is uh, from the actual, uh, when we were actually using the uh, VRA for validation. So you can see at the bottom here uh, is where we publish this information. Uh, in, again, in molecular ecology resources, but we did validation of the actual SNP genotyping array with uh, almost 1,000 samples that we used for the validation. And you can see here in the middle what I want to emphasize is that we have uh, collaborators from Aquagen and Cygene, so they have uh, added uh, a very significant amount of the SNPs uh, in, the, uh, in the array that are from resequencing of 12 of the aquagen fish. And then the third resource for the SNPs on the array was from previously published SNPs. There's obviously overlap between the SNPs that we used. We looked for overlap between those resources and those SNPs that we prefer to choose. Overall, uh, from the 50, 57, 1,500 uh, SNPs on the array or spots on the array, almost uh, 50,000, which is about 86%, were uh, validated as highly polymorphic uh, SNPs based on the criteria that, that are used with the Affymetrix uh, software for best practices analysis. The fish in the panel, so there were a total of 960 samples. 19 of them were those double haploid lines that you already had uh, previous genotypes for them. Uh, there are also uh, un unrelated populations, almost 300 fish from 18 unrelated populations, uh, aquaculture, U.S. aquaculture populations and some wild populations. And we also had pedigree information from uh, families that we used for, for additional research, but it, it helped us uh, validate within those 10 pedigrees, that those are really behaving in a Mendelian inheritance fashion and are, uh, what are the true SNPs and what are not. And then we looked at polymorphism. Uh, so in the aquaculture populations in the US, uh, there was a very high number of polymorphic markers, uh, almost 41,000 per population, which is also consistent with previous genetic research in rainbow trout that's showing that the majority of the variation is within populations and uh, at least farm populations, aquaculture populations and not between. Uh, it also worked very well for uh, the, uh, the group at the Aquagen that uh, co-developed the SNP with us, the SNP chip with us. Uh, I don't have numbers from their population but they uh, confirmed that uh, it was very polymorphic and worked very well for them. And uh, in, with wild populations, there was smaller sample size popu per population, but uh, overall, it seems like there is a trend that, uh, that we saw a lower level of a uh, number of, of polymorphic markers per population, but the lowest number was 10,000, which is still uh, very good for most application. And given the small number, I think that 20,000 at least would be more of a likely number when, when sample size is larger. We looked at the minor allele frequency, and this is here showing going from very low level of about uh, right here, about uh, 0.05, but it keeps 
going up and uh, expanding to almost 0.5. It's a, it's a typical spread. We, we did not pre-select SNPs for minor or little frequency, uh, at least not from all resources. So it, it's, uh, we're pretty happy, and it's, again, uh, the high level of polymorphism is an indication that uh, minor or little frequency is not a problem for most of the SNPs with most of the applications that we have been using. Also distribution on the genome. So it is showing uh, in general what we expect to see, the uh, small number chromosomes uh, are higher, there are the larger chromosomes, and it goes down toward the, uh, the large number chromosome are smaller in size. And with the, the two exceptions here, two chromosomes that we know from our genome work that, uh, that there are uh, some, some issues going on with those chromosomes, and uh, that give us, we, we, we have good idea why there's higher number of SNPs than what expected based on uh, chromosome size in the hierarchy on those. Uh, this one here, the deep one in chromosome 13, still not sure why we got uh, a deep there number of SNPs. But overall, uh, the picture is a good distribution of SNPs from all chromosomes across the genome. So uh, that's a uh, genotyping array, the Axiom Child Genotyping Array 57K is available online. It uh, can be purchased from Affymetrics, and it is, uh, there are two versions. It's kind of hard to see. It. It's a little bit blurry, but there is a, a 96 format version and the 384. The 96 means that uh, it is uh, doing 96 samples at a time, and then 384 is 384 at a time, and there's there are minimum numbers for ordering that uh, can be found out from a few metrics or, you know, can also ask me how I'm ordering it through email and what numbers I'm dealing with. Uh, but that's uh, basically it's a product that is commercially available online. And then uh, we use that to uh, develop a dense genetic map in collaboration. It's really our uh, Norwegian uh, collaborators at uh, Nofima first, and then uh, Sigborn Lin at uh, Saigen that uh, kept that work with a large number of families. We developed uh, a genetic linkage map that allowed us uh, as guidance to build chromosome sequences from uh, sequence scaffolds that, that uh, we've also uh, done with other collaborators. So what we're seeing here is on the x-axis is this is a typical chromosome. Chromosome 4 is really behaving very nicely. Not all chromosomes are behaving that nicely when we're plotting the genetic linkage distances for each SNP against the physical distances. But that's uh, the picture perfect. And so what we're seeing here is uh, it's hard to see, but there are small dots. Each dot is representing a SNP. And then we're plotting uh, the flat line here. The bottom one, the gray one, is the male linkage map. And there, uh, for people who are not familiar with working with linkage maps in Salmonids, so there is an area of very low recombination in most of the chromosome in the middle. That's a typical picture of what you see in males. And then in females, there is a much more proportion uh, of, of the genetic distance is much more proportional to the physical distance because the combination is much more even all across the chromosome. And then there are those areas of, uh, toward the end of the chromosome, of much higher combination in the males. But this is a uh, really happy to to be able to see that type of pattern that uh, we expect to see. And it's also a very good way to spot chromosomal aberrations and other issues in rainbow trout genome and uh, find out 
what area of the chromosome exactly those occur. Uh, we hope to have the new a reference genome. Well, we are in the process of uploading it to NCBI. We hope to have it uh, within six months, uh, expected release to NCBI. Uh, so that's, that's hopefully coming. Uh, we've been waiting for a long time, and, and we're, there's still more tweaking, but it's, it's uh, in the making. Then uh, the linkage map that we, that, uh, we developed, we provided samples and genotype, but uh, the bioinformatic analysis, most of it was done in Norway. So it was used in two publications so far for comparative genomics in the publication of Lean et al. of the Atlantic Salmon in Nature this year, was published this year, and a publication that our group have just uh, put recently, and uh, Right here, it is in Frontiers in Genetics. We have the proofs of final version. It is available online already, but final version will be uh, available very soon. And the, an older version of the dense linkage map uh, that include all the SNPs is on this uh, as supplemental information in this publication. So when this is out, I do believe that people can actually go online and if you want to download the linkage map, in Excel files, it should already be there as supplemental information. And for that portion of the presentation, I just want to uh, acknowledge Dr. Gao from uh, my group. They are highlighted in red. There's obviously a lot of collaborators, very important collaborators in the genome work. In the interest of time, I'll mention the bioinformatician from USDA, Dr. Gao. Uh, Dr. Moran, Thomas Moran from Aquagen, who has uh, worked very closely with us on the SNP development, has done the uh, SNP uh, discovery and database for the Aquagen fish, and uh, Sigborn Lin and Matthew Kent from SciGen did the genotyping, and Sigborn Lin worked with us on the genome and the linkage map, and Matthew Baranski did the initial uh, the first version of the linkage map that we have been using and also need to acknowledge funding sources for the development of the array. Uh, USDA, the in-house ARS funding and the extramural. The, uh, in Norway, the Research Council provided funding for the research there and Aquagen provided their own funding for genotyping and sequencing of the fish. Now. Uh, I have a few more minutes, so I'll uh, talk on, I'll speak about applications that uh, we have been using for a genome-wide association and for genomic selection of bacterial cold water disease resistance. And that's here in the National Center for Cool and Cold Aquaculture of USDA in Lee Town, West Virginia. So first, I'm showing the results, and this is from a about the sample size was about 1,500 uh, fish with phenotypes for disease resistance, and there is a, there are different statistical approaches. The one that I'm showing here is called the single step awaited single step GBLAP. Uh, that of course I don't have time to go into all the details, and it is in preparation. The results of this, the source population is one of the eight trout lodge uh, breeding populations uh, that, that they're using trout lodges. Uh, uh, we have a lot of, uh, is a good research partner, uh, excellent population material. We have done the phenotyping of the fish with a lab challenge here. And what we can see is we can uh, map the SNPs back to the chromosomes and we can look, what I'm showing here is a Manhattan plot where on, let's use the arrows here. So this is showing uh, the percentage on the, on the y-axis is the percentage of genetic variation that is affected. And actually the SNPs that uh, we're showing, it's what, each one of those points here is a window of 20 SNPs that are 
uh, adjacent to each other. We use the linkage map, the first version of the linkage map, as a reference here. And so to, it's, there are different ways of doing the analysis, but uh, we found Roger Vallejo, our uh, statistical genomics here, uh, has identified that in windows of 20 SNPs, uh, it was the optimized uh, way to reduce uh, background noise to signal. So we found three uh, major chromosomes with strong effect of those uh, loci of adjacent SNPs. So it's uh, 25 and uh, 25, 8, and 3 that have a strong signal, and there are weaker signals, uh, smaller QTL on other chromosomes. But I'm going to move and focus on just chromosome 8 and basically showing now how uh, using the GWAS and the knowledge we have for the linkage map and the physical map, we can now uh, all those tools allow us to focus on the area of the genome where those uh, SNP windows are and uh, much faster than we use, could do in the past. Really, okay, uh, much faster than we could use, do in the past, focus on uh, the chromosomal region. The, what you see in red there are the SNPs here, each, uh, each dot represents an actual SNP, not a SNP window. So those that are highlighted in red are the actual uh, SNPs from the QTL region with a signal uh, that give a signal to cold water disease resistance. Uh, the, the correlation is not as nice as the previous uh, chromosome that I've shown because we use the older version of the linkage map so that everything falls in order. But uh, I need to move forward. So uh, this is for illustration only now that we have a genome. This is actually using the uh, a genome browser that has a previous genome from the uh, inner genoscope group that was published previously in uh, Nature Communication in 2014. Uh, the new genome. Uh, still, we do not have it internally on Genome Browser, and uh, it will take time. But basically, Genome Browsers are different software that allow you to upload data into uh, Genome Browsers. And what I'm trying to show here is how we can uh, put the SNPs from the SNP chip down on, uh, here. In this area are the SNPs from the large database that we have. And this is showing that uh, this is one of the pieces of the chromosome that actually had a, a chromosome sequence in, in an order that they were able to orient and order the scaffolds on the genome. So this is a, a big picture of how the SNPs are, can be aligned with the genome. And then just blowing it up a little bit, so we can already see how, and here I'm just showing SNPs from the SNP array. Each one of those here represent a SNP, of those spots represent a SNP from the SNP array. And this is just to illustrate that they can be aligned with predicted exons or can be, if, or can fall in areas that are between genes, but uh, that way if you know which SNPs are associated with your trait of interest, you can further focus on uh, what genes are in that area, what other genome, genomic sequences and elements are in that area of the chromosome and the genome. And the last application, I really, I guess, need to speed through that, is genome selection. And so typically, SIB selection is used in traits like a disease where the fish uh, can be uh, from the same family, same, uh, some of the siblings can be phenotyped. For example, uh, it, they can be challenged in a disease challenge. And then there's, if those fish are genotyped, this is called the training population for uh, genome selection because you can have genotypes and phenotypes 
from the same fish, and then you can genotype their siblings and predict the genetic merit of the siblings for the trait. So the way it's been done traditionally is just based on pedigree and phenotypes, in which case there is only a genetic merit prediction for the entire family. So all the, in the selection candidates, the testing population, all the uh, brothers and sisters have the same genetic merit prediction, versus with genome selection, we can assign uh, specific values based on the genotypes to the, to the uh, testing population, to the potential breeders, and then this is just showing that it worked very well for cold water disease resistance in the same population. Uh, and this, this is actually in second revision now. It's, it is going to be published soon, this work. And so uh, basically what it is showing here is that for each uh, paternal, let's look, here, this is a paternal half sib, so the same male was mated with two sisters. One sister in the red had a low a genetic merit prediction for cold water disease resistance. In blue, had the high a predicted merit. And we can see that at the end, there was about, uh, the average was about 20% higher. And this is in progeny testing, so this is actually after disease challenge of the offspring of those crosses where each time uh, one male was mated with two sisters, one with a predicted low genetic merit and one with high. And we were able to confirm it just based on differences. So this is just differences between uh, female parents uh, and we can find a really strong response. And that's all in a lab test for the challenge. Uh, so it, it has correlation with field performance, but it's not, we don't expect the field performance to, the, to be as big as what we see in the lab, but it is confirming the accuracy of the predictions. And this is another way of looking at it in a, a, a little bit larger sample. That's the whole population uh, that, that we looked at of 138 families. Again, this is based on their progeny performance. So we correlated here the predicted genetic merits. We, we correlated the predicted genetic merits. Here is the genome uh, predictions for uh, the two parents. We averaged the genome predictions for the two parents and plotted them against the actual uh, survival of uh, the, the actual performance of the offspring, and we're seeing very good, good correlation. Uh, correlation is uh, 0 0.71, which, which is very good accuracy. This is how we measure the accuracy of the prediction, where uh, the average genome prediction of the parents is a very good predictor of whether the offspring from that family with the, what will be the survival of the, of the progeny from the disease challenge. On the other hand, if we look at the traditional pedigree based, and again, this is uh, the, it's known as a BLAP model, which is only using pedigree and phenotypes to predict, and the same correlation, so the mid-parent value correlated against the actual uh, performance, mid progeny performance, and here the correlation was 0.35. So using the traditional approach, which we, we have been using with our experimental USDA population successfully in the past, we have achieved progress, but it is showing that we're almost doubling the accuracy of the prediction so that uh, clearly you say that, that we can, not only we can distinguish between uh, offspring or between sisters, within the family or brother, whether uh, one of them will be a better breeder for a cold water resistant than the other. We can also see that overall in the population, there's uh, much better accuracy uh, also in ranking between families. And uh, overall, we're doubling the accuracy of the genome breeding prediction.
and I think I hope I did not go too fast here but again these are all results that are in the process of a review or being submitted to uh, publications coming soon so just a uh, last slide before acknowledgements to summarize uh, how the genome selection technology has already been used by the industry uh, so our aquagen uh, there were our collaborators our co-developer of the of the snip uh, they have successfully identified markers that are associated with IPNV resistance in rainbow trout. They had done it before in salmon, now they've done it in trout, and they're actually selling eggs to their customers, the farmers that, are, uh, that have increased IPN resistance based on uh, the genome information. And Trout Lodge is going to offer in uh, this May, May, coming May, for that population, they're going to offer added value product that will be fish that, are, that have better cold water resistance and those uh, are done based on the genome merit predictions from the study that, that we've done with them. And again, obviously it's a, a lot of collaborators and uh, groups that I have to acknowledge. Uh, right. So I'm going to have to mention the primaries here, uh, Dr. Vallejo and Leeds from, from the USDA that uh, are the client, Roger is a statistical genomics guy and the team leads a quantitative geneticist, uh, but we have uh, a large group, the Fish Disease Health, Jason Avenues was a lead uh, scientists from the fish health on the challenges and phenotyping. They're doing a lot of work on that. And then our industry collaborators, uh, the leadership there from their R&D is uh, Jim Parsons and Kyle Martin that have been excellent uh, collaborators and really an asset for us as government scientists to demonstrate to the industry the potential of the technology cost, of course, and there are other issues, but definitely we've demonstrated the potential of the technology. And there, uh, we have an excellent support groups or support as scientists and uh, technicians here that deal with the molecular lab work, with the fish, uh, fish handling, fish breeding. And we also uh, got a lot of advice and help from uh, groups in the University of Georgia and Iowa State that, uh, that are still developing, have developed, and are still developing the algorithm and programs for uh, statistical genomics, for uh, genome merit prediction, and also for the GWAS uh, that, that I've seen before. And I think that with that, I can stop and, and be ready to take questions. Well well, thank you very much for your um, presentation, Doctor. And I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We're going to try to answer as many questions as time allows. Uh, Dr. Palti, um, our first question is, is why do you choose the Axiom Array over the SNP genotyping technologies? Okay, so at the time, uh, when when we looked at our options, the main uh, main reason was cost. So it's not a secret that uh, the the competing is still today, but uh, definitely at the time, which is 2013, is when we were ready to start working on SNP chips. Is uh, the Illumina BDRA technology? Uh, the Illumina has an advantage of more flexibility uh, in number of samples. You don't have to start with 96 samples at a time, for example, but the cost for this number of SNPs was uh, not, not even comparable, so it was definitely much more affordable, especially for the large type of projects that we are interested in and that are the co-developers of the array from Norway were interested in doing at the time. 
Thank you. Uh, Dr. Palti, you referred to cost. And what are the current costs? And what does the cost coming down mean? Okay, so the cost that, that I'm seeing now for the uh, 300, when I'm using the 384, a well version and with that we have to start with at least 1920 samples but my cost currently of the last genotyping contract that I have is a, at $60 a sample when we started with the 96 uh, well format uh, three years ago then my cost was about over $120 sample so that's that's the way I see it on the consumer uh, I can uh, I have good estimate this this includes the uh, the actual cost of the array that the genotyping provider is uh, paying to Affymetrics to purchase it from Affymetrics and their cost their added cost of the labor and overhead whatever they need to take and probably some profit that they need to take from uh, doing the genotyping. So all I do is I'm arraying my DNA samples in 96 or 384 well plate uh, and certain amount, usually it's about 500 nanograms per sample and I'm sending it out and I'm receiving back the large files of, of raw data and, and I go from there. I'm putting it on the pipeline of computer that is uh, that can be downloaded for free there's there's very uh, useful manuals and software provided uh, free of charge from Affymetrix that can be downloaded and used to analyze the data and I guess that's I can stop here okay thank you um, we do have time for one last question. And what is the sensitivity of the chip to DNA quality and quantity? What was that again? Can you repeat? Is that a problem? Yeah. What ahead. is what is the yeah, what is the sensitivity of the chip to DNA quality and quantity? Uh, uh, we haven't messed too much with it. I mean, we, we have a good quality DNA because we're, we're doing lab experiments. Uh, you know, it's, it's not, we're not too limited, but uh, the only information that I have is when we try to use other salmonids that are not rainbow trout and to see if we can genotype other, even cutthroat trout, which is relatively uh, genetically close to rainbow trout on an evolutionary scale. So uh, it, uh, a lot of the chips, a lot of the SNPs on the chip are already not validated, maybe half of them, and it, it just didn't go. We had to exclude those samples because it didn't pass through the quality control threshold for genotyping, but I mean, we, we always try to send at least 500 nanograms of uh, good quality genomic DNA that, that we can obtain. We, we do have every once in a while samples that fail, but uh, typically it's, um, we, we get over 97% of the samples to come back with good genotypes. Thank you. And, and Dr. Palti, do you have any final comments before we let you go today? Um, no, thank you very much. Uh, it was really uh, in increased the productivity of our research immensely to, to work with this array. And again, to the people of the audience, I know that my email is not on the presentation, but it's, it's very easy to find me online or through uh, publications if there are follow-up questions that people want to forward either through uh, through the webcast or directly to my email. I'll, I'll be glad to. I know that I, were, I had to go through some of the things very fast. So thank you very much.
Well, thank you, um, Dr. Paulton. I'd also like to thank Dr. Beecham for his presentation as well. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through April 2017. You'll receive an email alert from LabRoots when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.